ministry. Um, hopefully as well bring to the fore some of the less well known women that were involved um, because we do know the big names. Um, but you wouldn't have any movement without the, the less well known figures. So um, hopefully this is just a taster of just some of those women that were involved. Um, to start off with, um, in Ian and the Heron, um, set up by Maud Gaughan in 1900. Um, Maud is in the centre there holding the banner. Um, this movement, this organisation, it was way ahead of its time. Um, it was an organisation set up to promote all things Irish nationalism, um, promote the use of Irish goods. Um, it was a Dublin based organisation, and you have a lot of girls from the inner city that are involved in the in the hearing. Um, they were very forward thinking when it comes to education because they saw that they're living in the inner city communities, they're looking at what choices are there for kids, and pretty much girls, it was going to work. Um, boys, it was going to the British Army, pretty much that was it. Um, they wanted to change this, so they set up uh, schools. Um, they had one in North Bay, Georgia Street, um, and these girls, uh, Marcella Cosgrave is also in amongst that group, um, they actually taught the kids, um, their schools for, for boys and girls, giving them a choice, showing them that there was another choice for them except gone, you know, to be cannon fodder in the British Army. Um, a lot of the boys that they taught then went on to join the FINA era. So you have this revolutionary, um, this introduction to revolution from a very early age from these women. But this is before Sinn Féin, this is before the Irish Volunteers, this is before coming them on. Um, but also they had a social conscience, not just in education, but in feeding the kids um, that were living in the poorest areas in Europe. Um, just up the road, um, some of you may know the Penny Dinners in Main Street. Um, the church came to Inina to help feed the kids of the area, and they did it with none. Um, so they were very, very uh, socially aware, and that's a, a thread that you find throughout the women, um, throughout the whole revolutionary movement, this social conscience that we have. Um, the girls would actually go out on a regular basis, parading um, the, the city streets, because they were aware as well that so many young girls were going out with British soldiers and so on, and so they were trying to show these girls the other ways um, to have no contact with the British military whatsoever. And they were often great for doing this, but they did this regardless. But Nina only went so far, um, because you do have, there's a change, um, there's a there's an increase in nationalism and so on, especially with the, the setting up Sinn Féin in, in 1905. But then of course you have this massive build up, there's an increase in, in what's going to happen. Um, of course you have with UVF being set up in 1912 up in uh, Belfast. Um, you have that organisation set up to basically ensure home rule will not be introduced. And then down here, they're looking and saying we need an organisation to ensure home rules introduced, so we have to set up the Irish Volunteers. Um, also, you have the Citizen Army set up in November 1914. Citizen Army also included women in, in its organisation, but it was felt that there was a new, there was room, new scope for a different organisation for women that wouldn't be just be centrally located in Dublin. And so, come to Mon is set up in April, 2nd of April, in Wins Hotel. <coughs> um, what you have with the, the Laren gun running and so on, where they bring in the arms um, land them and land them in Laren. You have again the Irish volunteers saying, well, we should bring in guns. Um, with the whole gun running, was actually the suggestion of a woman, um, Molly, sorry, Mary Spring Rice. Um, she was on the committee that helped raise the funds to actually buy the guns that were landed at Holt. And she herself raised £2,000, which was a huge amount of money in 1914. Um, she herself <coughs> was a member of the Limerick Coming the Month and uh, she actually took part in the whole gun running um, with Erson Childers and also his wife uh, Molly Childers. Um, but as we know, when the guns were landed, now the guns were gotten away safely. But however, you do have the, the shootings on Bachelors Walk where the British military opened fire on the crowds who were basically uh, taunting them. But what this photograph shows is the funeral procession of the victims of the massacre. Um, what's interesting, a couple of things, the lady that is actually leading the procession in the poem in Trafford, her name is Teresa Redden, and she was a member of the central branch of Cumberland. 
Um, she actually came from a, a fairly wealthy family. Uh, she lived out in our town. And the pony in the track does actually belongs to the horse. She did keep horses. Um, horse songs were members of the scene. Um, she's leading this procession. But the women that are behind her are members of coming them on. And you can know that some of them, they have like a, a white ostrich feather um, in their hat. And this is a sign of protest because the ostrich feather, feather was um, a sign of cowardice. And they're basically saying this is a military open on our civilians. It wasn't military men, it wasn't soldiers that you were fighting, it was innocent people that you fired upon. Um, and you find this trend, this is repeated over the years, and it's the women that will do this. Um, often they, they are unharmed, but unfortunately in some of these protests, the women themselves come under attack from the, the DMP, the military and so on. Um, <coughs> but then what we have, um, you have this, this increase in interest from coming them on, or people, want, women want to join coming them on. An event that helps trigger an increase, an upsurge in the, the membership, um, is a Dunham and Ross's funeral in 1915. And um, the women do parade in that procession, but um, you do find a lot of the girls join either just before that funeral takes place or immediately after it. Um, this girl here, uh, Stan Holden, the, the lady, that's uh, Kathleen Lynn, um, Dr. Kathleen, and uh, she's a member attached to the Citizen Army, which is set up, or helps, set up by James Arkin and um, James Conley. But um, this photograph, um, this shows Tomas McDonough with his two children. Um, I think it's Kathleen called and Barbara, his daughter. Um, Kathleen, first day was essential. Um, the girls had to be trained the first day. So she would actually go to Liberty Hall um, on a regular basis and she would train up the girls. Um, you find a lot of girls are working in Liberty Hall or the, the shop that they set up, the little call shop that they set up immediately after the lockout of 1913 because a lot of girls that were out in the lockout couldn't get their jobs back so Connolly sets up with Delia Larkin um, a, a little sort of factory um, so the girls are there um, but Kathleen she would come and teach the girls in, in basic four days. Um, on top of this um, you have coming them on also doing the same thing so four days they have to have that training. Um, Kathleen would then go on to take part in the Easter Horizon um, and just to give a little bit of background to the Easter Horizon, um, you're, you're all aware that the, the countermanding order was meant to go off on Easter Sunday, but with the countermanding order, of course, to take place on Easter Monday. Um, and because the countermanding order from home was nailed, the numbers that torn out is, is really, really reduced. However, they do take over the KO post. Um, and one of the things that, that a lot of people say in recent times is that they, they didn't know what they were doing, as in the buildings they take over, really what was the point in taking over those buildings in particular. Um, but when you actually look at the buildings, they were on every main road that the British had to enter. They had to pass by those buildings to get into the city centre. So it's not the fact that they didn't know what they were doing, it's the fact that the countermand in order reduces the numbers that take part in the event. Um, just to this Next, these next couple of photographs are just going to highlight um, some of the women that were at each of the outposts. So Kathleen Lynn, um, she was in City Hall. Um, you have the Citizen Army stationed in City Hall and College of Swords, Stevens Green Station and College of Swords. And um, she initially went to Stevens Green Park and then drove to City Hall. However, the the actual small garrison had made their way into City Hall, so when she arrived, they had actually locked the gates. She actually had to climb over the gates to gain entry into the city hall. Um, Sean Connolly, Captain Sean Connolly, a uh, member of the Citizen Army, is the first casualty on the, um, the volunteer side to be killed. Um, and it is assumed that Countess Markovich is the most senior um, ranking woman involved in Easter Week. But um, Kathleen, because Sean had been killed, she was actually a captain, she was next in line, and when the surrender for this garrison comes on Tuesday, um, she's the one that actually deals with the surrender of that garrison. Um, just this girl, Bridget Davis, <coughs> she also fought in City Hall, and uh, she was actually with Sean Connolly when he was killed. Um, she tried to save him, and the uniform that she was wearing at the time um, still has his blood um, on it, but that she kept that all her life. She didn't wash it, she just kept it in the condition that it was um, at the time. 
thankfully it's now preserved, it's uh, actually in Cumhainham Jail. But um, what you find after 1916, Kathleen Lynn and uh, Madeleine French Mull and all these women who fought in 1916, again it's the social conscience that's coming in because they were saying that the infant mortality in Dublin was, was extreme. The, the, the rates the, were just unbelievable. And again, something needs to be done, but it wasn't being done by the government. Um, they set up, with the help of Kathleen Clark and so on, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, it opened officially in 1919. Um, it actually opened its doors in 1918. The British allowed them to help with the Spanish flu epidemic that was taking place. But it officially opened its doors in 1919, the first infant hospital in Ireland. Um, but what Kathleen insisted was the girls that had been with her in 16 in City Hall, they actually trained as nurses in St. Olsen's. They worked in St. Olsen's, including Bridget Davis. Um, her daughter was named Constance after Countess Markovich, and she herself worked in St. Olsen's. Um, so you have a continuation right down the line. Um, Bridget was actually, Bridget was arrested after 1916. Um, the women from City Hall were held in the Ship Street Barracks and then transferred to Richard Barracks and then to Cumhainham Jail. And they were present, unfortunately, when the leaders were being executed. Um, again, just to talk about some of the Citizen Army women, um, there on the left we have Margaret Senator, um, and she was from Glasgow. Uh, she was actually told by Connolly to come over uh, in the week prior to the rising. And um, she brought over where our detonators and that she smuggled in on our person. Um, and these are the risks that the women were willing to take again and again and again. But um, she was wounded severely in the fighting. Um, she was leading a party of men from the College of Surgeons to Hardcore Street because, as you know, Stephen's Green was completely surrounded um, in 1916 by the British military. All the white buildings were taken over, looking into the park. Um, and the idea was that Margaret and her uh, company would go to Harper Street, step far to a building, the British were next door, and then the fire would spread and that would then leave them out. But in the process, I think was one man was uh, shot and killed, and Margaret herself was shot in the spine, um, and it took her seven weeks to recover from her injuries. She wasn't arrested because of her injuries, um, but it just shows that they were actually in the firing line. Um, then, of course, we have on the right um, Countess Markovich. And the Countess, a lot of people would say that um, she was, she, she is the, the, the big name. There would be some people that would be negative towards Countess Markovich. And whether you like her or love her, it cannot be denied that this woman gave everything for the cause of Irish freedom. Um, she helped set up the Fianna Air in 1909. Um, she literally gave up everything to the cause. And in 1916, she second in command to Michael Madden, who was in the picture with her as well. This photograph was uh, taken in Richard Barracks after the surrender. Um, and she was treated exactly like the men initially. Um, she was court martialed, she was found guilty and sentenced to death. And the only reason the sentence doesn't uh, take place or isn't carried out was because she's a woman. Now, as we know, initially the Irish people, the majority of them, didn't support the Easter Rising. You've got the city destroyed, there's a war going on. Um, and as they were being led through the streets, being brought up to Richard Barracks, the people were spitting at them, throwing food at them. Um, however, quickly enough, the, the opinion starts to change from the Irish people because what they began to realise is that these men, they're, they're not superhuman, they're ordinary people. Um, and they fought a clean fight, they were fighting for a belief. And um, with the execution certainly and with the personal stories that begin to emerge and told by the women, um, it does begin to change and the British government realised if they execute a woman they will lose the support of the people so the Countess are sentenced to commute to life imprisonment. Um, also what you have throughout this whole period, and this would be any revolutionary period, um, you do have women who are actively involved. But also you have the women who support the, the men um, very, very actively. And then you have the women who are affected because of the actions of their sons or their husbands and so on. So they may not be actively part of the engagement, but they are affected nonetheless. And these three photographs just show the, the personal side to what was going on in 1916. So the top photograph to the left um, we have Muriel McDonough, um, Muriel Gifford, and her sister Grace with Muriel's daughter Barbara. 
Um, so Muriel was married to Thomas McDonough, fought in 1916, commandant of the second battalion, um, stationed in Jacob's Biscuit Factory. And then we have Grace. Now, <coughs> Muriel, when, when word was received that Thomas was going to be executed, um, they actually didn't get word to Muriel in time. Now, in the time that she actually managed to get to come out of jail, he had had a visitor from his sister. And when she got to the jail, she wasn't allowed to see him because they said he had one visitor, that was all that he was meant to have. She never got to say goodbye to her husband. Um, within a year, July, a little over a year, July 1917, Muriel herself was dead. Um, she died in a drown drowning accident out in Scaries. Um, it, 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 a trip had been planned for the, the wives and families of the men who had been killed in 1916. Um, and she swam out to the um, islands and she, was, uh, she drowned. Um, that photograph was actually taken just shortly before that event. Um, Grace, Grace's story is probably one of the, if not <coughs> the story, that really brought home to the people that these men and women were ordinary men and women. Um, because she was led to marry her fiancé, Joseph Sunk, just hours before his execution. Um, there was their sister, Nelly, um, who had taken part in 1916. Uh, I think she was in College of Surgeons, possibly. Um, could be wrong with that. But um, she was arrested um, and held in Kamehameha Jail, and she was there at the time of the wedding. Um, the only people at the wedding were Joseph and Grace, the priest and the soldiers. Nelly was not allowed to be her sister um, at the time when she needed her most. Um, they had no time alone together. Um, they had 10 minutes after the wedding um, in the cell, but they were never allowed any time alone. And she was married for less than a day. She never married again. Um, and when the people begin to hear these stories, it does begin to shift the tide of opinion. Um, in the centre we have Hannah Shee Skeffington. And Hannah's husband, Francis Shee Skeffington, um, was arrested on the Monday, I think it was, uh, Easter Monday, um, unfortunately by Captain Bon Coulter, who was stationed in Portobello, Calgary Barracks. Um, he was arrested and with two other men, two journalists, um, loyalist journalists actually, um, they were executed totally unlawfully um, on Bon Coulter's orders. And he had actually killed a boy um, during Easter week as well. Now, there was a huge cover up with this and it was down to Hannah's efforts that attention was brought. She was determined to find out what happened to her husband. Um, and she found in Colonel Vane, who um, was also stationed in uh, Portobello at the time, um, he listened to her pleas. And an inquiry was uh, set up. Um, it was really a farce because he was, Bone Coulter was found guilty of what I'm saying. Um, he was sent to an asylum and within a year he was released and just shipped out to Canada. Um, but thanks to her efforts, the people discovered what happened to her husband um, and it was something that she was determined to do. Uh, the bottom photograph is here to the right. We have Amy Kent and his wife, Anya. And what I found when researching the book is that this time, this period of time, um, you find men and women actually coming together. Relationships blossom throughout this period. They have things in common. Um, the Gaelic League, which is where I think Amy and Anya met, um, they have these things in common, which really didn't happen before. Um, these are like the first generation that marry for love. It's not for society, for the betterment of society. It's actually because they do actually love each other. Um, Anya herself didn't take part in the rising. Um, she was actually out in Calgary's house with his wife who was pregnant at the time. Um, but Amy was obviously at a fourth battalion. He oversaw the fight in the South Dublin Union. Her sister, her sister Lily, though, however, was in Marigold Lane uh, Distillery, which was an outpost of that garrison, and she was in Cremainham Jail when Eamon himself was executed on the 8th of May. Um, then, of course, we have uh, Kathleen Clark here. Um, she had wanted to take part in the rising, but her husband Tom, who really is the mind behind the Easter Rising, um, he believed or he saw that there was another role for Kathleen to play and that was to actually help reorganise the movement. He had known that the leadership would be killed um, but it had to be reorganised and he gave the names of men that had to be contacted um, and also goals because he knew that the families of these men would be destitute. The men are the, the, the breadwinners and um, their families had to be cared for and she was very, very successful in doing this. 
Um, you have the Irish National Aid and Prisoner Dependence Fund set up as two organisations initially, um, but they realised that they were doing the same thing, so obviously they're better together. So you have the Irish National Aid and Prisoner Dependence Fund set up, um, and Kathleen is at the helm of this. Um, and also to raise money, you have girls from coming them on um, every week. They would go out. Um, go house to house, and again, these are the poorest areas of Dublin, um, Bridge Street, Cook Street, and um, all around. And the people gave what little they could. And these are poor areas in our city of Dublin, but the people gave. So you can see that again, that shift in opinion. Um, and it was also with Kathleen, um, she recognised the qualities in Michael Collins. Um, she realised the potential that he had because he had similar qualities to Sean McDermott, who she was very, very close to. Um, and she gets him into the position of finance with down the cost he goes in as he is over the Department of Finance um, later on. But it just shows that without the women, really the organisation would not have been reorganised to such an extent without the effect and without the assistance of the women. Um, and here is just one example of the effect of that. Um, now, this photograph is of uh, Kansas Market, which was returned in 1917, and you can see the streets are packed with people. But literally a year before, these people had been throwing food at these men and women. Um, and what <coughs> is, is essential to this change is that the women were out uh, putting on masks for these men. They were collecting fun, uh, funds for their families. Um, they were shown the Irish people, these are your people. Um, there is a war going on for the freedom of small countries, but yours is a small country as well. Um, and there's the result. The people are there to welcome home in thousands these men and women who they saw as traitors the year before. Um, well one really interesting thing was um, that I discovered was Law of the Mon. And this is held on the 9th of June 1918, because of course you have the <coughs> war still going on, Britain needs more soldiers, and the threat of conscription was a real it really existed. Um, and you have organisations coming together to basically um, join and unite against the British government saying you will not bring in this, this threat. But the women and coming on organised this on the 9th of June, there was Women's Day and it was purely to let the women have their voice in this um, against conscription. 14 to 15,000 women signed a petition in City Hall and that was actually organised by coming on. So they are shown time and time again how effective they are with propaganda and how propaganda is essential to the movement. Um, it's all political work, it's not military work, but it is no less important than the military aspect. Unfortunately that isn't seen in the pensions um, when the women apply. Um, that work is not seen to be important, but certainly at the time it was essential. Um, just this photograph has again shown the personal side um, because life does go on. The man in the centre, that's George Fulton, and he was a member of the Citizen Army and he ha was out in 1916. Um, his wife, Elizabeth Fullerton, they lived in Kilmainham. Um, but George was sent to Frongock. He was released a little bit earlier than the main body of men. His brother had been fighting in the British Army but was killed, so he was released um, as a result of his brother's death. Um, and he came home, they had a young family, but um, of course there wasn't a wife, so uh, you know, they, they have more children. But this photograph um, is of their kids, known as the Republican Triplets. Um, their godmothers were um, Kathleen Lynn, Countess Markovich and Grace Gifford. They're actually named after their godmothers. The person that's missing from this photograph is Grace. Um, this photograph, the christening, actually took place around the same time as Muriel died, so Grace couldn't attend the funeral or the christening because she was attending the funeral of her sister. So George took her place. Um, tragedy did follow. Um, only one of the triplets did survive because soon after there was an accident. The pram that they were in, um, it, it, when the child was actually caring for them but lost control of the, the pram and the pram toppled over and two of the triplets were killed. Um, Kathleen Lynn was, was the only triplets to survive. Um, and then just moving on, what you have between 1916, December 16 and the, the outbreak of the War of Independence, those two years it's essential to actually get the support of the people to actually the planning of what is going to happen with the next stage. 
Um, but also, they need, if the, the way they're going to fight the war of independence obviously is guerrilla tactics, and they need to have the support of the people behind them if this is going to succeed in any way. Um, you have the, the general election in 1918, and again, the women were out in force for this. Um, and these photographs just show a couple of aspects of what the women were doing throughout this time. So the top photograph is the uh, McGuinness um, election, the famous poster, put them in to get them out. Um, and in this photograph you have actually his nieces, um, John McGuinness's nieces, campaigning for him. All members are coming along. Um, amongst that photograph you've got Green Lines Thornton who had fought in 16. Um, you've also got Margaret McGuinness, um, Breed McGuinness, um, all his nieces. But the women campaigned actively for the, the, the Sinn Féin um, candidates and were very successful. You've seen it. The election was a whitewash um, of victory for Sinn Féin. But also they educated the people how to vote and they realised that women may not necessarily be able to vote because they're married for families and so on. Um, Coming them on organised um, bases for these women. They organised travel for the elderly to make sure they got out and vote. And on the day, they actually set up first aid stations um, around the city. So they're actively involved there, and it is no doubt down to their involvement that the election was so, such a success for Sinn Féin. Um, the other photograph on the right, this is the funeral of Pierce McCann from uh, Tipperary. Um, he was a member of the Tipperary, Tour Tipperary Brigade, um, what became known as the IRA then. Um, and he had died in 1918. And again, this photograph, it was just to be repeated time and time again all over the country. Um, you do find that um, you, with a lot of protest meetings and so on that are going on, um, the police would always be there and in most cases, as I just mentioned earlier, the women would not be touched by the police. There is one incident in Foster Place. Uh, this was in October, October 1918. Um, Countess Markovich um, and I think Kathleen Clark were in Holloway Prison at the time and the women were protesting against their treatment in Holloway. And the police were present and they actually bat and charged the women. Um, they also arrested some of them. You find a lot of the Anina branch of coming them on. Um, they were involved in the events that day. One of the girls, Josie McGowan, was 18 and she was involved in that baton charge. Uh, she died soon after. Um, the official death search states caused death of pneumonia, but um, our family believed it was due to the actual baton charge that day. Um, so they are right there on the front line. So just to go on, this is Margaret McGuinness, Joseph McGuinness' uh, niece, um, and this photograph, she's 13 years old in this photograph, and she's holding his rifle. Um, and the McGuinness girls from Longford, they were really at the forefront of coming among in that area. Now Longford was just a, a hotbed of activity, of course you have Sean McGill, and um, he's from there, the Blacks and the Van Lee. Um, there is a huge presence of military. Now, War of Independence begins in January 1919. There's a slow build-up. Um, it's 1920 that the War of Independence really escalates, um, and especially with the arrival of the Black and Sands in March 1920 and then the Auxiliaries. It just really escalates to uh, unimaginable proportions. Um, but a factor of the, the War of Independence is intelligence, intelligence gathering. It's essential to the success of this event of this war and again the women are the ones that are putting themselves on the front line gathering this intelligence and this photograph here on the right is actually a photograph taken by the McGuinness girls and um, their home they lived above the drapery shop that was owned by the women and so regularly they would take photographs of the patrols of auxiliaries and this is just one such photograph they would then bring this information to Dublin and the GHQ um, also, they'd be transporting weapons, grenades, ammunition, and so on. And Margaret herself was actually arrested on one of these um, these trips, and she was held in Mountjoy Jail. But her case was actually brought before the House of Commons, and um, because of her age, she was only 18, 19 at the time. She was eventually released, but it just shows the type of work that the women were doing. If they had been discovered doing this, you can only imagine what would have happened to them. Because with the photographs. Um, we do see the women in, in <coughs> terms of that 
time frame, 1916 to 23, but they were women before, they were women after, they were children, they were young girls, they were old women. And this photograph, these two photographs just show that um, we have Nora Quinn um, as a young girl there on the left, and then this is Nora Quinn, then Nora McCarthy, married, um, married to a volunteer, um, Daniel uh, McCarthy. And he had actually, he was from Kerry, um, he had been arrested in 1918 and was sent up to uh, Cumberland Road Jail in Belfast, where Nora herself is from. Um, but she had an arrangement with the, the prison officers in Cumberland Road um, that she would, she was a pot chain maker, she'd bring them in pot chain and in return she'd get uniforms and guns and so on. It must have been while he was there and she was going to the prison that she met him because soon after he was released. Um, and they say it was down to her efforts that he was released. She got him a job in, as a tram driver in Belfast and they thankfully lived a happy life, long life together. Um, but it just shows their life before and their life during and then their life later. Um, just again, the Belfast family here, we have the Bradys. Um, now, what was really interesting about the Brady sisters and the whole Brady family, they were all involved in, in the movement. Their father, um, he was involved in the textile business. He became manager of a huge company in Belfast. Um, very unusual for a Catholic to do that. But the interesting thing about their father was that education was essential for the girls. The boys could look after themselves. And this is what I found when, when researching the book. For these women, if their families could provide it, education was essential. The boys would go into the family business, find a trade or so on, but the girls had to have an option, apart from just being married. Um, and their father ensured that each and every single one of them was well educated. Um, educated in Trinity College, um, Queen's University, travelled around the world, um, and they all came down to Dublin. Um, I think it was Beatrice, she married Andy Cooney, um, who was uh, very much a prominent member of the IRA, and um, Andy Treaty later on, as were all the sisters during the Civil War. Um, just to go back to when the, the Black and Tans arrived and uh, the auxiliaries, the escalation of war and independence, um, these two photographs um, show Thomas McCord and obviously the tour of the Cork Brigade and then um, the vice of the Terence of Sweeney. Um, unfortunately what you have with the escalation of the, the war of independence, there is limits are just, they don't exist. Um, if there's an ambush by the IRA, the military, especially down the Cork with the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries, they will hit back hard. Um, and regardless of the consequences, because unfortunately they are being protected, certainly when it comes to the auxiliaries. Um, Thomas McCourton was more in front of his wife on the eve, on the 20th of March uh, 1920. She was pregnant with twins at the time. Um, unfortunately, she not only lost her husband, but she lost the babies as well. And this is the, the reality of this war that the women have to face. Um, they are not just losing a husband or a brother, they're losing. Uh, there is such personal loss that they are, they are suffering and in, in one case it was the loss of our two children as well. Um, after Tomas's death, um, Terence Sweeney succeeds him as obviously of the court brigade, but he had been married then, so that shows him with his wife and young child. Um, and Muriel, his wife, um, she when they got married, in their first year of marriage, he was imprisoned three times. Um, and in 19, August 1920, Terence himself was arrested um, and he was put on trial, he was found guilty. Um, and immediately upon, upon being brought to prison, Brixton prison, um, he went on a hunger strike. Now, Muriel, and this is the tragic aspect of it, she actually begged, she went to the IRA GHQ, and this is Michael Collins, uh, and pleaded with him to order Terence to come off the hunger strike. Um, and he would, uh, they wouldn't give that order. After 75 days, he died, and leaving behind a young wife and a young baby. Um, and this is the reality of this period of time. Um, just to also point out that it wasn't just in, in Ireland that you had the support from the people, and certainly from the women, um, there was support in England, but in America there was actually a huge amount of support. Um, and you have it that there was 100 um, nurses, Irish American extraction, um, were actually planning to come over to Ireland during this period 
to give their services to be in the fields helping men that were wounded and so on. Um, and again, the propaganda element to this, because they're, they're not in Ireland, it seems that these women do take it to a completely different level. And there's many photographs of them destroying the Union Jack. Um, one girl in New York climbed up on a theater, ripped down the Union Jack and, and set it light. And these photographs are there. Um, and this photograph just shows, again, it's recognized the Irish Republic and so on. So you do have that support across the water as well. Um, again, just to show another aspect, or again, a similar aspect, these photographs here, the processions, the, um, the, the, when you have the hunger strikes going on in Mount Joy, um, when you have the executions of Kevin Barry and the, the six men in March, the Forgotten Ten, um, the women were there on a daily basis. Um, they're saying the Rosary, as you can see here, the Exodus Stewards in the hunger strikes, um, and with Thomas Ashes' death, um, the women actually kept the crowds back so the men could be brought to the Mar Hospital from Mount Joy. Um, but these images are powerful because they were then being shown all around the world what is going on in Ireland. And then when people from other countries begin to see what's actually happening in Ireland, you have this opinion starting to change and then people start asking questions including in England. So the governments are seeing that these people and especially the women, propaganda, they're experts at it and they realise that propaganda is essential to this to this actual war. And um, this photograph um is of Linda Cairns um on the right you have Ethel Hall in the middle and May Book um, and this photograph was taken shortly after their escape from Mount Joy, um, just prior to the truce in 1921. Um, Linda had been, was a nurse um, and she had set up a, a small hospital um, on, in Easter week. She wasn't actually attached to the volunteers um, or a member of coming them on or so on, but she, at that time, but she had set up a hospital for them. Now she does become involved. And one element, again, an essential aspect of the women's contribution was transporting weapons. Um, Linda is one of the few women that has a car at this time, um, and she was based down the Slive of Jordan War of Independence. Now, the British had brought in an act, um, or special powers, uh, that if an IRA man was found with weapons, guns, ammunition, they could be liable for execution. Now, she was actually bringing men and weapons um, for a proposed ambush and the three men with Linda, when they're on the way, they're stopped by the patrol of military. They were arrested, but when the, the soldiers asked them who owned these weapons, Linda said that they were hers because she knew that if the men admitted to it, then they would be executed. Generally, they wouldn't execute a woman. But she herself was arrested and held in Sligo jail, she was held in Derry, she was held in Belfast, she was um, found guilty at her trial. She was sent 10 years imprisonment in Liverpool and protested um, that if she was being held in prison, well, she should be held in prison in Ireland. So she shipped back to Mount Joy and immediately planned her escape. And uh, the three women were very successful in getting away, but she'd gone on hunger strike and protest our treatment. And this photograph, it's not taken long after um, the escape. It's not long after her hunger strike. but. Um, Again, it just shows the, the, the value um, of propaganda. It's a very powerful photograph. Um, and also the essential role that women had to play in this period. Um, of course, just with the, the following on from the, the truce being declared um, in July 1921, you have the, 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 the six, well, five, five months or so um, of a relaxing period. Now, this was totally to the benefit of the British side. Um, where you have training camps and all being set up by the IRA, as Tom Barry said, the men had no barracks to go to. The men had no place to keep that discipline that they had been used to for the previous two and a half years, where the British had their, mar their barracks and so on. And it would suit the British that the men might become complacent. Um, the treaty that was signed in December 1921, as we all know, it didn't give the Republic that they were fighting for. Um, but the treaty was signed and it was brought home to Ireland. And then, of course, the, the Republican movement, both the military and the political, they split. Um, and it's the women coming among actually split itself. 
Um, and they're the first ones to hold a convention in February about the issue of accepting or rejecting the treaty. And these two photographs just show both sides. Um, because the pro-treaty side of the women really isn't heard about, and they were actually quite active. But there on the left, we have um, the, I would say the, 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 the well-known faces of the anti-treaty side. Um, first on the left, we have Kathleen Clark, of course, um, Tom Clark's widow, personally suffered um, throughout this whole period. Um, Countess Markovic beside her, um, fought actively in 1916 and you know, in prison so many times. Um, a member of Parliament, she's there. Now the girl beside Countess Markovic, that's Kate O'Callaghan, a member of Common Amon, Limerick, but her husband, George O'Callaghan, Michael O'Callaghan, who was the Lord Mayor of Limerick, was more in front of her. So again, a woman that is devastatingly affected by the conflict. And then of course we have Mrs Pierce, his two sons, um, Patrick and William Pierce killed, executed in 1916. The other photograph shows the pro treaty um, coming along branch down in Cork. Um, now, amongst those who are pro treaty in Cork would be Lil Conlon, May Conlon, and so on. Um, but there's great letters uh, in the Lil Conlon files um, between Mary McSweeney, because Mary McSweeney is Terence's sister, and um, she's very much anti treaty. But you have both pro treaty coming along and treaty coming along. And Mary McSweeney is writing to Lil Conlon, or Mae Conlon, saying, How dare you um, retain his name coming him on, use our trade as your second uh, treaty. And Mae Conlon is saying that, um, well, no, we're as much Republican as you. And there's these arguments going to and fro, and um, also they carry them out in the, the newspapers. Um, but it just shows that there was support, there was a pro treaty element of the women as well. An interesting fact that the women are seen to be hysterical in the, the lead up to the Irish Civil War. Um, they're the ones that are seen to be emotional, they're making all these insightful speeches um, telling men, you know, don't don't accept this, um, the Republic's bought you, fought and died for it, but we have suffered for my son didn't die for anything but the Republic. Um, and the women are seen to be inciting conflict. The reality of the situation was the women were they're experiencing the realities of war from 1916 right through. They watched their husbands, sons, brothers, kids go out. Um, they had to deal with the raids on a regular basis when off and alone, um, in the middle of the night, a, a party of troops arriving at your house, destroying your house. Um, they actually saw what war would bring and they knew that if civil war happened, that's what's going to happen again. It wasn't a woman who made the speech way through Irish clubs. It's as simple as that. If a woman had said that, we know it was De Valera, if a woman had said that, you can only imagine the feedback, but it was De Valera that said that. And unfortunately, you have politicians that are saying these, these things to men who have fought and killed for an ideal and will fight and kill for that ideal again. <coughs> the difference between it, De Valera had been in, in America for 18 months, 19 months of the War of Independence. He didn't see the realities of that conflict, whereas the women did. Um, just to show how close the divide came, um, here we have members of the Ryan family, and they were split right down the middle when, when the Civil War actually did come. Um, the top photograph is Phyllis Ryan, the youngest of the Ryan sisters, and again, this family had been out in 16. Um, they had fought right through the War of Independence, and unfortunately were personally affected by the Civil War. Um, Phyllis married uh, Sean T. O'Kelly, with the photograph taken of them in, in later years. In the centre we have Min Ryan, um, who was a sweetheart to Sean McDermott, um, and she was married to Richard Mulcahy. Um, at the time of the treaty they had two, at least two young children, and then the bottom photograph is Jim, their brother, and the treaty, and his wife Maureen. Um, but there are letters that exist um, between the family. You have um, another sister, Kit, I think it was, and she married Dennis McCullough, who was also pro-treaty. And there's letters between the whole family to Kit and Min saying, leave your husbands, they're traitors, you're a traitor, you stay with him. Um, but what could these women do? They've got young families, who is going to provide for them? And the family were devastated by the Civil War, but they did come back from it because when their children started to grow up, the family realised their kids are not going to have any contact, they won't have a family unless we can get past this. 
and um, it took a while, but they did come back from it. But the thing was, don't talk about politics. And as a result of that, their kids grew up knowing who their aunties and uncles were. Um, just to show um, a pro and anti treaty side here, um, the girl on the left is Madge Hales, sister of Tom and Sean Hales, and um, Torbess Corporate family. And again, family devastated by the Civil War. Um, right there from the early days when the volunteers were set up. Um, but of course, Tom, Robert, and William, and Donald, or your other brother who was based in Italy, um, they all rejected the treaty. You now, Tom had been in prison at the time, um, he suffered terrible, terrible torture um, at the hands of um, Captain Kelly. Um, the man that was with him, Hart, went insane because of the treatment. Um, Robert and Liam involved in many ambushes down in West Cork. Sean, um, and Madge accepts the treaty. Um, Tom was involved or was present on the day that Collins was killed down in Bed and Blot. Sean didn't believe that his brother would have had to do with the killing of Collins. Um, and while up in Dublin demanding a full inquiry, a full investigation, Collins' death, he was then shot and killed um, near Ormond, the Ormond Hotel, just beside the Ormond Hotel. Um, and that what Madge's family shows is a complete the vice of nature of the Civil War. They lost everything. Their house had been destroyed in the black, by black and tans. And their father had a nervous breakdown as a result of what had happened. She lost her brother. And soon after, Tom was arrested, uh, Robert was arrested, and uh, Liam was arrested. And she had to deal with this. So not only the loss of um, her brother, her father's health, the home, this is what they were facing. And there's begging letters, um, very sad letters, written by Madge to the Department of Defence um, asking for compensation because Sean, because he was um, in the army, he was the only breadwinner. So they had no money after he died. And the father was going to have to be taken out of the home if they couldn't provide for them. So again, this is reality of what was going on. The girl on the right is Mary Jo O'Connor. She was from um, in Chicago. And all of her family, our brothers, you've got our brother Porrick, um, Sean O, Michal, um, and their dad, they all went pro treaty, but she could not accept the treaty, she just couldn't. Um, and rather than stay in Ireland, um, she knew that if she stayed here, she would have to not only fight them, but, but friends, men that, and women that she was very close to, she couldn't do that, and she decided to leave. Uh, she went to France. Now, what I absolutely love about um, Mary Jo is the fact that she has a life in France, but of course World War II breaks out, um, and she helped the French resistance fight against the Nazis, and was actually awarded the medal by the French government for her contribution. This is a girl from Inchicore. It's just, you wouldn't think of this. Um, and so the, these two photographs just show, again, the pro and anti treaty side of it, where just, it wasn't anti treaty women, there were pro treaty women as well. Um, just to show the, the youth um, of it, this is Kay Fallon. Um, she was 15 years old and she was arrested, she was anti treaty, and she was a courier for the Republic, and she was from Galway. Um, and what you find when the war or the civil war escalates, um, you have raids being carried out by the pro treaty forces. A um, couple of stages to the Civil War, you've got the staged battles initially, certainly with Dublin, um, but once Dublin falls you have the retreat down to the south um, and you've got the guerrilla tactics that were so successful um, to the IRA in the War of Independence, but then of course from September, October um, 22 to the end of May 23 literally is just a free for all. Um, so once there's one side hitting the other side, the other side will come back harder and of course it leads to the terrible atrocities that take place between in March and um, down in Kerry in 1923. Um, but Kate, when the Free State Force came to arrest her sister, her sister wasn't there, but they knew that Kate was a courier um, bringing messages for the anti treaty IRA, so she was arrested, 15 years old, um, taken up to command in jail. Um, a lot of the women left memoirs and um, diaries, fantastic accounts, and she remembered a time in Kilmainham as one of the happiest times of her life. She used to play in the ba uh, padded cell, which is still there. Um, she used to bounce off the walls. But that's one side of it. But the other side of it is then she was part or was involved in the um, riot that happened in Kilmainham in uh, April, March uh, 1923, when they were shifting the women out from Kilmainham to the North Dublin Union. 
um, and she was one of 60 women. It took them four or five hours to remove these women from the East Wing, um, and they were beaten, kicked, dragged down the stairs by their former friends. Um, and despite that, she remembered a time in Kamenum as one of the happiest times of her life. Um, an interesting thing to know is that when the war starts shifting, the different phases come in, the men are being arrested for what they actually do. They're arrested in the process of doing something, carrying out a raid or destroying documents or so on. The pro-treaty government, the, the provisional government, realised that the women were dangerous, very, very dangerous in terms of propaganda. And because they had seen what they had done in 16, they were the ones responsible for them coming home as heroes. Um, and again, they had used them in the War of Independence, but the government actually felt they were losing the war, starting by January um, 1923. And they need to keep the people on side. And to keep the people on side, you need to get rid of the women. They cannot be actually out, but, you know, shown the Irish men, the anti-treaty men as, um, as heroes and so on. And with the special Emergency Powers Act that was brought in, you find massive arrests of women. And they're arrested for what they might do. It's not for the actually what they actually do, it's for what they might do. And the perfect example of this is Mary McSweeney, who was arrested on her way down to the funeral of Liam Lynch. Now, she had been put in jail, but she was set free. And the government realised that if she's at the funeral, she might use that as a platform. So she's re-arrested even before she gets to the funeral. Um, they knew how important the women were at changing the minds of the people. Um, just to show you the aftermath, um, these two photographs, the top photograph, um, that's Eileen Bell with her husband and kids, and then the girl below, that is Mary Boyce with her husband and child. Um, these two were lifelong friends. They were members of the Rumkondra branch of Coming Among. Um, both joined around 1920, 1919, 1920. Um, and Eileen used to actually keep weapons in our house. Um, but they remained lifelong friends. They lived in Galtimore Road, only a couple of houses away from each other. And what these two photographs show is that they weren't defined by the revolution. Their life went on after 1923-24. Um, as I said before, there were women before, there were women after. Um, and it wasn't that the revolution defined them, if not just the other way, the women defined the revolution as in the way that it was fought, the way it was carried out, because literally you could not have fought it the way it was fought without the help of the women. But this just, these two photographs just show um, life after the revolution. Um, this photograph is of um, the groups, uh, a gathering of women, and these would be women from both the prone and treaty side. Um, sitting there is in the centre, that's Phyllis Ryan, who was at that time um, uh, the wife of President uh, Sean C. O'Kelly. And you have some attempts to heal the divide after the Civil War, and this will be just one example, where no matter what side you fought on, um, Oris and Uteram was open for um, a day a year and the women were to come and they were to be remembered really for, for what they did. Um, and this continued on for a time. So there you have women who fought in 16, war of independence and against each other in the civil war as ladies um, at one of these events. And you had similar events um, throughout like the tea mornings that they'd have in Toddy's Bar and Gresham, the Gresham Hotel as well, that continued on for, for uh, quite a while. Um, just to, again, carry on from the, the aftermath, uh, the salt graphs of Kathleen Stark standing in the Stonebreaker's yard. Um, again, just going back to the start of what I said about the, the whole social conscience of, of the women. Um, you have the women been involved in community projects, in, in boards for the elderly, um, for children, for health. Um, again, it's the social aspect that comes through. Unfortunately, with the, the conditions of employment bill and the 1927 constitution, it really restricted the rights of women and the role that women had to play in society. But you find that the women sort of go around this in, in ways. And um, through their local communities, they are very, very successful um, in what they do. Now, Kathleen Clark, first lady, Lord Mayor Dublin, um, served two terms. And the first thing that she did was to remove all the portraits of the royals um, from the, the, the building. Um, but again, 
in aspect, they weren't afraid to, to stand up for something they believed in. And no matter how difficult it might be, if they believed that it was right, they would do this. And one of the things that Kathleen fought for, even though she personally didn't agree with it, was the whole issue of um, un un unmarried mothers and um, contraception. And she realised it was a massive, massive problem in Dublin. And although personally it was not something that she believed in, that realistically this had to be addressed. And she took on Dublin Corporation with this notion, her motion was the views. But um, again, it just shows that they weren't afraid to stand up for something they believed in. Was a happy note. Um, these two women, um, just there on the left, we have um, Essie Noddy, and then on the right, we have May Gibney. May Gibney was out in 1916. She was actually the sweetheart fiance of Dick McKay, who was killed on Bloody Sunday in Dublin, or Dublin Castle, and um, Paddock Clancy and Connor Clue. Um, and May was a member of the central branch of Coming Them On. Essie was from Carlow. And during the War of Independence, you had women from Dublin sent out to reorganise or to organise branches around the country. Maybe that weren't as active. And um, it was in Carlow, or was to Carlow, that May was sent. Um, she met Lawrence O'Neill, her future husband. She was um, OC, I think, of the Carlow Brigade. Um, but also she met Essie. Now, the two of them were arrested during the Civil War. Um, they were imprisoned in Kilmaine and Jail together. But of course, when the Civil War ends and, and they leave, and then life goes on, they get married, they have their families, they lose contact. But actually, both of them thought that the other one had died because they hadn't heard anything for years upon years upon years. And um, it was in the late 70s, I think it was, and May was actually, she, her name was on the Roll of Honor, and she came to the National Museum to get her name changed because her marriage name was on the roll but she wants to have her maiden name on it and the man that was in charge at the time was Snoddy and she was talking to him saying that you know um, it's an unusual name I did know Snoddy and you know but she's long dead at this stage and uh, obviously what was her name and she said Essie Snoddy and it's actually his man um, and she was very much alive and um, so they hadn't seen each other for 53 years and this photograph shows um, them reunited together um, and I just felt that that photograph just sums her all up. These women that had been through so much together, um, they, people would see or would tend to see the women as the handmaidens of the Republican movement, that their role wasn't <coughs> vital and um, I would argue that no, they were essential. The, the IRA has been seen as, the, as an invisible army. Um, the secret army, the women were the ones that were actually the invisible army, and without them, I certainly would say that um, that we didn't, we wouldn't have achieved what was achieved. Um, without the efforts of women like Esther Snoddy and um, May Gibney. So, um, everyone, on that note, I will uh, say thank you very much, and um, I, I hope you enjoy. Thank you.